Yeah, hi guys. So today we're going to talk about um, extreme chromaticism in the blues. And you would think that such an apparently simple form as, as the blues wouldn't incorporate uh, much chromaticism at all. Um, but in its simplest form, the blues is certainly not chromatic and basically pentatonic. And of course, you just, whatever your root chord is, you do the minor pentatonic of that root chord all the way throughout the entire blues progression. Um, you could even, just for the uh, demonstration purposes, you could use that pentatonic scale even when non-blues changes are arising, like uh, European style changes as in the turnaround. So uh, I'll, to demonstrate that, just to be clear on that, I'm gonna lay down a 12 bar blues using uh, the turnarounds. Actually, in the future, I'm gonna describe there are actually two turnarounds that exist within the, within the blues. What is a turnaround? When I do this, it takes me back to the beginning. It turns me around to the beginning of the song. So it's a chord. It could be one chord. It could be many chords. Um, but you could generally sense where that turnaround is happening. It's almost like the end, the very last melodic phrase that happens uh, right after that, the turnaround will occur just as soon as you hit the, the last note of the melodic phrase often. Okay, so here's a 12-bar blues. I'm going to play G minor pentatonic. I'm in the key of G, not the key of G. I'm rooted in G. I hate using that term key of, and you guys should know why by now. Uh, I'm in G, and I'm going to play a G minor pentatonic across, and I'm going to use some European-style chord changes, non-jazz, non-blues chord changes. Um, that certainly can be implemented in the blues, and in the form called Chicago blues, they do use a lot of um, European style changes as well as American blues changes. So here we go. <laughs> students when I teach them how to jam on the blues and I give them that first minor pentatonic scale after a while they come to me and say well is that all I could do isn't there more color um, the only way you can get away with getting more color is to be not to use global scales and again a global scale is one that you can employ throughout the entire chord progression you don't have to think twice you just play that same scale but then there are specific scales and they relate to the very chord that you're on okay uh, so um, now let's talk about chromaticism in the blues. Uh, we know that the art of blues is having the skill to blend minor and major together. And in the past, I've attempted, like, for example, I've talked about this already, but say on a 1, 4, 5 of the blues, the G7, the C7, and the D7, each of them have their own specific scales that you can't use on the other chords just but just on that chord. So G major pentatonic, uh, I could use as well as G minor pentatonic. Now, since this is the root chord, this is king, all right? Um, now, uh, C major pentatonic against the C and D major pentatonic against the D, uh, I could blend those with the overriding G minor pentatonic, right? Now, one experiment I tried was, well, what if I blended the G major and G minor pentatonics together as one scale? Listen to what we get. So I have the root of both, G. I have the second note of the major pentatonic, which is two. I have flat three from the minor pentatonic. I have three from the major pentatonic. I have four, which exists in both. No, wait. No, the four doesn't exist. It only exists in the minor. The five exists in, in both. All right. 
let's just take it that far and see what we get. Now, if I were to add the flat five blue note, all right, let me really highlight that by doing it on one string. So I'm going to do whole step, and the rest all the way up to the five are half step. So. There is one of the reasons why you find extreme chromaticism. Now, how, how is it that this can work? Again, the dominant seventh chord is the by far the most sophisticated and complex chord of the three types of uh, chord types we have, major, minor, and dominant. All right, dominant seven is most complex. It's the female. It's the woman. Uh, all right, so... Now, from this chromatic moment, there's another way to look at this and why uh, we could get chromatics. So if I, um, if I just go up to this, this much of blending the two scales together, major and minor, I get. Now, you must have heard, if you like the blues, right? And that also is allowed to go up. That is called the blues turnaround. Now, um, one reason, one way I discovered all of this chromaticism that could exist is I did the blues turnaround. I'm going to do it on the high string now, the E string. Right? Now, if I were to harmonize that, now I get this set of notes and this set of notes. Now, what my harmony was in thirds. Right? You hear that turn around. Now, this, um, so my first line was this. When I harmonize it, I get this. Oh, sorry. Now, this one, I can go up a third from there, a minor third, and harmonize that one and get... So now, if I look at my G root, I could start on the flat seven and go all the way down chromatically to the two. Now, question, does it work? Yes, it does. Let's play our blues and see. We'll try to get some of those chromatics in there. stop there. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, we'll get into it a bit later. Now these, uh, all right. So one way I just, again, found all of this chromaticism was by harmoning the initial blues around and harmonizing that. All right. Now, one way to look at this is you have your root, which is G. You can either start your chromatic movement in a downward direction from the flat seven, which is a whole step lower than the root G. All right. Um, or you can start a whole step up from the G. using a little bit of uh, jumping around the chromatics. Okay, so um, the, the rule of thumb is basically to go start going upward, you, you start with the root and go up a whole step, and then the rest is chromatic all the way up to the flat seven, which in this case is F. The other rule of thumb is to start on the root and go down a whole step, and then start continuing downward till you get to the two. So basically, you have your root. You can either start a, a whole step below and descend or a whole step above and ascend, okay? Now, this isn't 
global, all right? It's specific. What I just showed you was specific to the G7 chord, which means this. When I get to the C7 chord, I have to think likewise, but according in relation to C. So now I have my C root. I go up a whole step and then start going chromatic. All right, so uh, let's hear that in blues context. I want to wait for the longer uh, section of C chords to come. Here comes one, two, three, four. Now I'll do the descending and again, waiting to get to the longer C chord. Instead of going, I could have gone. All right, completing that whole uh, chromatic string. So really, see, the art is detecting the root of the chord you're on and then proceeding with chromatics. What this does, uh, chromatic comes from the word for color. It's we're talking about adding color to the sound. Well, those of you who are bored with just a plain old global pentatonic scale, this is the way to get color, okay? Little story, I had um, a young 16-year-old student who was remarkably uh, instinctive about the blues. He played pretty authentic blues. It was really cool to watch. Little Jewish kid living in the Pacific Palisades, right? Little white guy. Uh, but he really, really had captured the soul of it. Unfortunately, uh, he never really pursued music, uh, and out of his brothers and sisters, I thought he was actually the most musical of them all. I taught all the kids. There were four of them. But I always thought he was the one that had the flair, but he wasn't really interested in music. He kind of, eh. Um, and, he, and, you know, I asked him, too. He loved blues. And I said, why do you like blues? You, you don't even have blues in your music you listen to, like, you know, when you do the iPod thing, you know, well, iPod. When you shuffle through your iTunes, you know, uh, you don't have the... Uh, the blues in there necessary. He goes, well, you know, one of my um, buddies, his dad would drive us to school and he'd always put on the blues station on the radio on the way to school. And I really started to like the blues uh, from that. So interesting. Uh, all right. So where are we? Where are we? We're uh, at the idea of, oh, I, to tell the story, actually to continue my story. Well, this kid, he liked mostly rock and blues. He didn't, he wasn't interested in jazz at all. But he made the mistake of joining jazz band in high school. And uh, they were doing the song Moon Dance. And uh, he comes back to me the next week and he goes, um, you know, I had showed him the chords and everything. And then he showed and how to solo with pentatonic use. And he was using a straight pentatonic scale throughout the solo. Anyway, he came back the next week and uh, his teacher was kind of a scumbag. I won't go into that, but I didn't like the guy at all. He was a real ass. But uh, in any case, the teacher complained that his solo sounded too much like rock. So he says to me, you know, he wants the solo to sound like jazz. And I said, dude, I cannot teach you jazz in one lesson. It's an extremely complex affair. I said, but I'll give you a hint. When you have your, your pentatonic scale, you have two fingers on each string. If you want to get some color, fill in the gaps. Don't stick long on those uh, gap notes, but fill in the gaps. All right, and uh, even in a blues context, of course. That's the cheater's way. There's no theory behind that. You just take two fingers uh, of the, you know, at, the pentatonic, of course, has the luxury of having two notes per string as you go up the scale. So you fill in the gaps in between and you get color, chromatic notes. What I'm showing you is the theory behind the chromaticism and how, how and why it does work. All right. So anyway. <laughs> So again, the art of blues is being able to detect where your root is and play around chromatically with that. Ideally, on every chord of the blues, when I hit this G7, 
I should know where my root third, fifth, flat seven root is. In other words, an arpeggio of the G7 chord. And this ditto for C, C7, and for D7. Uh, knowing, uh, you know, right off the bat, I mean, I always, you could freeze me in time while I'm soloing, and I could tell you immediately what element of the chord I'm on, whether I'm on the ninth, the third, the fifth, the seventh. Granted, this takes a lot of training. How you start with that training is by practicing arpeggios. I have a really neat um, dominant seventh chord arpeggio exercise, challenging, but it teaches a lot. And uh, if I get any requests, if anybody in the world is listening to my voice in the desert and they're interested in this, I'll upload the uh, arpeggio, the uh, uh, dominant seventh arpeggio exercise. Uh, to give you a taste, it's like this. basically nine arpeggios within that uh, different fingerings, every possible fingering for a dominant seventh arpeggio, starting on either the root, the third, or the fifth, not the seventh, because it would, it would kind of break up the flow of the exercise. But believe me, knowing the root, the third, and the fifth is quite a bit. That's, uh, you could start targeting that, you're doing well. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do right now is I, I think this will be a short and sweet little video, even though there's so much complexity to chromaticism. I can't think of much else, but what I'd like to do is demonstrate right now all of this chromaticism per chord. Now, when you think about it, OK, before I do that, when you think about this, uh, I said to target the root and you could start a whole step below and start descending chromatically until you get to the two, a low, an octave lower. And then you go a whole step when you get to the two. Or you can start with the root and go up to the two, a whole step again, and keep going chromatic until you get to the flat seven again, which is a whole step from the root. So you're protecting the root by whole steps on either side, okay? All right, so... Um, What was my point in that? I damned if I remember. Okay, uh, so anyway, let me just go ahead and uh, demonstrate um, how I'm doing this per chord, and you'll hear all the color. In fact, what I'll do is, uh, in the first chorus of this, I'm just going to use the pentatonic scale, and then the second chorus of this, I will start using the chromatic so you can hear the difference in color and what is possible. Okay, here we go. <laughs> that I've uh, done over and over again through the years. The beauty of this is, you know, I have students that, that say to me, teach me a lick. And it's so weird to me because it's kind of like if I was in Japan and, and I didn't speak a word of Japanese, it's like 
asking my uh, teacher of the Japanese language, teach me a phrase in Japanese. Um, if I know the rules of syntax, of Japanese syntax and grammar, and uh, the um, pictograms and the alphabet, I'll be able to construct my own phrases. So I, I wouldn't have somebody, I wouldn't have to ask somebody, teach me how to say what time is it, what time is it? Because I'd be able to construct that myself. So I never really understood why people say, teach me a lick. Um, when I do teach a lick, I'll, off, I'll always go into the music theory behind it. What gives you independence and freedom as an improviser is understanding and comprehending the theory behind it. It's not parroting a bunch of licks that you heard everybody else in the world do. I'll give, you know, uh, as great as he was a guitarist, Stevie Ray Vaughan, when I first heard him, I thought, what's all the fuss? He's fast and he's passionate, but there's nothing new in his licks I'm hearing. These are all the standard same old blues licks I've heard over and over and over again. Granted, they're fast and fiery, but really... Uh, that goes to show you, though, the element of intention behind your soloing. And that's, I'm, I'm thinking of starting a series called Music Philosophy because there's a lot of uh, spiritual and psychological aspects that go into presenting music to people that go beyond understanding theory and technique and all, all that stuff. It's more the top of the triangle. One thing that's really, really important in music is your intention and your energy. OK, um, I, I used to do various exercises with students to get them to open up the creative side of themselves, the top of the uh, triangle of musical excellence. I'd say something like play what fire sounds like or play the color blue, um, play a calm lake, play uh, a, a thunderstorm. All right. All of these little things help stimulate your creativity and they give you an energetic slant that a purely kind of uh, sterile music theory point of view will not get you. Um, unfortunately, music itself, and this is part of, you know, the talks I'd like to do in the future about music philosophy is intellectualism in music. Music is very, very music itself is a woman. It's receptive and passive. And um, the problem here is that that woman can be subject to rape, unfortunately. She's a very vulnerable woman. And there are plenty of musicians out there, if you want to call them musicians, that really rape the hell out of the musical system. Um, uh, one form of rape would be over-intellectualizing music. Um, I have a particular disdain for people who see music as a quick sort of crossword puzzle that, that they're solving or some sort of pretentious intellectual exercise. Um, an example of that was uh, I was one time busking in front of my favorite place and buddy of mine introduced myself to this jazz guitarist. And uh, he started to talk to me about like, oh, how to get an outside sound. That's jazz language for dissonant notes that sound cool. And he said, yeah, you just take your basic pentatonic scale and move it anywhere on the neck. And I looked at him. I said, that's bogus. That's that's bullshit. Um, there's no theory behind that. You're just randomly hitting notes of a foreign pentatonic scale. that doesn't belong to the key you're in. I'm sorry. I don't. That's cheap. That's really cheap. But he wanted to sound esoteric. Uh, anyway, so that'll that gives you an idea. Intent is everything in music. OK. I had an acoustic band. We were doing gypsy jazz style renditions of um, classic rock songs. We were called the Venice Roasters. And we had an upright bass, acoustic guitar, tenor sax, and the drummer played with brushes on only a snare drum. That was entire, his entire drum kit. And we'd play in these little cafes. And I remember this one night, we hit the downbeat of the first song, and we came on with the power of a, a full out hard rock band with stacks of marshals. But yet we were this little combo using acoustical instruments. Um, that such is the power of energy. We, we we're all we all love this band. We we're having a great time with it. We love doing our gigs. So that love showed that energy that intent showed. Um, yeah, so I think maybe I'm going to give a series of lectures about the top part of the triangle of 
musical excellence, the philosophy of music, the heart and soul of being a musician and all that stuff. That could be fun. Anyway, I've gone way off course. Uh, I'm going to say goodnight, uh, but first this. <laughs> going to be a uh, minor to major third uh, um, in the separate chords of the blues. So you get that. That's a what I call a blues convention, very important convention that also uh, gives you more chromatic color and makes you sound more authentic as a blues musician. And not just authentic, but more skilled. You'll sound literally more skilled when you employ that principle. Okay, guys, have a great day and see you on the rebound, as they used to say. Bye-bye.